Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Placing Faces, the show where we sit down with some of the most influential casting directors in all of Hollywood and across the entertainment spectrum. I'm your host, Charlie Chappell, and today we're going to sit down with casting director, teacher, lover of animals, Marcy Learoff. But before we get into Marcy's world, and because this is our first episode, I want to start with the reasons we, my producer Maria and I, started this show. There seems to be a lot of misunderstandings as to what casting directors do. What happens inside of a casting room before an actor enters and after they leave? What is the actual process of casting like? And what role does a casting director have in making a movie? Just like a visual effects artist or a cinematographer, I believe there is a skill set and an expertise that is often overlooked. And I think that's a shame. So. Here we are to highlight the careers of some of the most important people you never knew you knew. I, I also have to say, I'm pretty excited to find out how some of the most iconic roles in history got their faces. I mean, how did Heath Ledger become the Joker? How many people had a say in who played Elliot in E.T.? How did the most Boston movie that ever dared to Boston, Gone Baby Gone, get its Oscar-nominated cast? I'm going to see if I can find out the answer to all these questions and more over the course of however many episodes I can get casting directors to sit down with me and talk. And there is no better person to help me start this show off than our first guest, Marcy Learoff. You may know some of Marcy's work. I mean, all right, you do. I'm sure of it. Movies like E.T., Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Pretty in Pink, Blade Runner, Mean Girls, St. Elmo's Fire, Fern Gully, Yes That Fern Gully, and Footloose, just to name a few. Having worked on so many well-known films, paired with Marcy's knowledge and innate ability to communicate, it makes a whole lot of sense that she also coaches actors, has a series of classes both online and in Los Angeles, and she's an accomplished contributor to backstage advice and has been for years. From her stories about casting one of the most iconic family films of all time to her advice on why you're not going into a casting office to get a role, a thought that seems unintuitive until she tells you why, Marcy is direct, she's sure-footed, and it was an absolute pleasure sitting down with her in her San Fernando Valley home. And especially nice to be joined by her sometimes snoring Rhodesian Ridgebacks, Tessa and Riley. You may hear them in the background. I've never met Marcy before this, so I think the conversation that we were able to have really speaks to how awesome Marcy really is. Her long career in casting a ton of the movies we all know and love was a fascinating start to a journey that I am really excited to be on and to take you guys along for the ride. So I hope you learn as much as I did. Thank you very much Hi, for Charlie. having us in your home oh, today. Thank you. With your wonderful dogs. They might make a cameo appearance later. We'll see. I, I have a feeling they will, <laughs> and that's totally fine with me. I actually wanted to start off talking about animal rights activism. Oh, I yeah. know you're an animal rights activist. Uh huh. You've got two beautiful dogs that you've rescued. How are you involved with animal rights? And uh, I help. I have a friend that has uh, a rescue group mm-hmm. called Ridgebacks and Friends, and. Uh, I help her rescue dogs. I foster dogs all the time and help them find their new home. I took in a dog, uh, a Chihuahua Min Pin mix over the holidays and came this close to keeping her. Mm -hmm. I would have been that lady with three dogs. Sure. But uh, she just was very bossy and my dogs were terrified of her, and so I ended up finding her a great <laughs> Your big home. Big ridgebacks were scared yeah, of the yeah. tiny so I ended chihuahua. up finding her a great home, and uh, I just want to help the animals that don't have a voice. Uh, I use social media a lot in terms of uh, getting the word out if there's a lost dog or if there's a dog that needs rescuing or fostering. Mm-hmm. It's a really great tool for that. So it's just uh, helping them have a voice. So with fostering, how how do you give the dog up after that? <laughs> that seems to be the hardest because I've fostered dogs before too. It's and it's very difficult to it, give it, them but back. I have two dogs already. I have to do the right. My friend pointed this out because I was so close to keeping her because she was so damn cute. Uh, and I found this lovely woman, uh, an older woman who's home all day, and she has another dog. Mm-hmm. And she said, "Listen, they'll." They'll play together. Your dogs won't play with her. Uh, this woman will, will be with her all day long. You're going to be off at work. And 
So you've got to do what's right for you in your household sure. and do what's right for the dog. So uh, I can't keep all the dogs. And so when you go into the foster situation, you've got to be clear on what you're doing. So like I did this on July 4th uh, for the last couple of years because the shelters get completely full with dogs that run away from their home because, oh, because of, the of the fireworks. fireworks. And so the shelters fill up. And so I've gone into the shelter and taken a dog out for a temporary foster mm -hmm. so that they have a space for the new dog, which usually gets found and rescued by their home, but it just makes more space. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. No, I think that's great. I, I, I love dogs. I love animals in general. Like I said earlier, I grew mm -hmm. up on a farm. so. Being around, especially bigger dogs, not a lot of people have bigger dogs in the city, which yeah. makes sense to me. You mm -hmm. don't have a lot of space for them, but being around them, it takes me back to, you know. They're great. Yeah, beautiful dogs. Um, so I, I want to get into, uh, I guess, your bio. Let's start at the beginning. Where did you come from? How did you get out here? How did you become part of the industry, what got you excited about well, it? Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I'm a native, ah, which is rare. Yeah, it is. I did not uh, set out to be a casting director growing up. I didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was not really my plan. I knew, uh, getting out of college, I knew I wanted to do something in the entertainment I business, but I didn't know what. Okay. It could have been music, film, television. I really didn't know what. So when I got out of school, I just started bopping around to different jobs and mm -hmm. getting experience and it helped, it led me to this casting job because I was working at ICM, International Creative Management. And I knew inside of a week, I did not want to be an agent. I really no. didn't enjoy that side of it, but I used it as university and able to soak up information. There's so much information that you can learn. But I, through there, I met casting directors and I saw what casting directors do and I got very interested in that end of things. And so after okay. being at ICM for about a year and a half, I started looking into getting a job in casting and started working for this company called Fenton and Feinberg Casting. It was Mike Fenton and yeah. Jane Feinberg. And it was back in the day when there were not 300 casting directors across the country. There were mm -hmm. probably 10 major offices and we were one of them. And so it was at a time when we were very busy and doing a lot of high profile movies and I was there when it happened. And they trained me very well. They taught me a love for actor, a love and respect for actors that was important. How to make a deal, how to work with your producers and your studio. And, and uh, I learned a lot there. I was there for about five years. And okay. uh, then realized I could go out on my own. And I did that and I've been a gypsy on the road casting director ever since. So with those first years at ICM, what sort of things did you learn? Because you said you wanted to be a part of the industry, but you didn't really know. What things that you learned then took you towards casting and away from? Well, as an agent, what you're doing is talking to casting directors every day. Mm -hmm. And so I was dealing with all the casting directors on a lot of really cool shows. It was, uh, we covered uh, Paramount, and so we, when I say covered, meaning we were submitting our actors to these casting directors on shows like Mork and Mindy, Happy Days, wow. uh, WKRP in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. Taxi, and so I really liked talking to the casting directors and I realized I didn't want to be a seller, I wanted to be a buyer. And uh, being at, uh, ICM just taught me all about the business, about the literary end of things. And uh, I had come from the job before that, I was a, uh, an assistant to the vice president of uh, foreign distribution for a, uh, a film company. Okay. And so we were selling the rights to our films to Abu Dhabi and Indonesia. And so I learned a lot about marketing. And so it just, if you don't really know exactly what you want to do, it's kind of good to work in different areas of the film and television business and and pick up uh, different information and see what it's like on a set. Be a PA. Yeah. And interact with all the department heads and, and, and uh, spend time with those different departments and see where your your instincts lie. Okay. So with that world, go transitioning from that to working with, I mean, the quintessential family film of E.T. Mm -hmm. We've all kind of heard the stories about, especially the, the boy who was cast in E.T. Henry e. Thomas. Henry Thomas. Uh -huh. 
we've seen the videos. And if you haven't seen those videos, they're going to be in the description. So please okay. check that out. Yes. What are some stories that we haven't heard about that film's casting? Are there anything that happened? Because that one, it's just, it's everyone's that is part. That's truly probably the best audition I've ever been in. It was, it's phenomenal. It it's so was, crazy to see that kid just. Yeah, yeah there's a, there's a lot it. to learn from that audition. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, one of the things as an actor, and I kind of I show this clip in my class, mm -hmm. is that from the moment it starts, he's in the scene and listening. Mm -hmm. It was an improv, mind you. Okay. Uh, he was given a circumstance, mm -hmm. and he just went with it, and no one told him to cry, no one told him to get emotional. They just gave him the, really? the circumstances of you. You have this alien, and the government official has come to take him from you and do everything you can to hold on to this, your special friend. Mm -hmm. That was it. And so all of okay. that was Henry. Uh, and, and in this, this day and age of people, uh, we were talking about this before, that no one has an attention span anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the internet in, in many ways has rewired our brains to have no attention span. And if something doesn't grab us right away, we click away. Mm -hmm. And if you could, the actors out there would, would be, um, I think, uh, mortified when they saw, if they saw how producers and directors watch their auditions, if they don't immediately get into it or grabbed, uh. they click away. Circling back to my point is that you have to make sure that from the moment you start that you are in it. When I'm in, in a casting session and, and we have a, a three or four page scene and I see an actor start to warm up by the second or third page, I realize no one's ever gonna see that because if he didn't start mm. immediately. If you're not on in the beginning, yeah. then yeah. Uh, but back to your question, because I know I went off on a oh, complete no. tangent. Feel free to go on any tangent. Uh, this is a long format show, so yes. Uh, Drew Barrymore was five when I met her, mm -hmm. and an extraordinary child for many reasons. And uh, she came in my office and sat down across from me in the chair and uh, lifted her <laughs> dress up over her head and proceeded to you know, talk to me <laughs> with her dress over her head. <laughs> she was just the most uh, wild, interesting, I mean, interesting at five years old, but it, she has an imagination as most children do. Sure. And uh, so when I interview children, I like to get them to talk. So I ask them questions where they'll have to not just answer yes or no. So, Tell me about your bedroom. What does your bedroom look like? And she goes, well, it's really messy now. Um, I said, what do you mean? She goes, there's all this band equipment all over the, the bedroom. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I'm in a band. I'm in a rock band. I'm the lead singer. She totally made the story up. Uh -huh. Absolutely not true. <laughs> But she was just, just so wildly unique and active fun imagination. And, yeah, love loved her. Yeah, I, I kind of want to go back now because you talking about Henry Thomas's audition. That was S S Mr. Spielberg reading with him, right? That no, was Mike or, Fenton. That was Mike. Yeah. Okay. So the backstory is sure. that we uh, had our choice for that main role. We had our choices for the other kids, his brother mm -hmm. and all the friends. And we wanted to see how they would interact together. So we had them all over the writer's house to play Dungeons and Dragons. And we would sit, awesome. we all sat around the outside of the room and watched them interact. Mm -hmm. And in about five minutes, it became very clear that no one liked this little boy that we had chosen. All the other kids did not like him. Hmm. You know how when you play a game, sometimes your true yeah. colors come out? Absolutely. And so it was not a good match. So we had to completely start over. And uh, this was before the days of the internet where you could just reach out and do an open call and have sure. people send you uh, uh, auditions. So it was a, a very different world in terms of communication. And so the director, Jack Fisk, had directed a movie called Raggedy Man. His wife, Sissy Spacek, starred in it. Okay. And there was a little boy in that film that played her son, which was Henry Thomas. Mm -hmm. And so he told Stephen, you got to see this kid. So we flew him out from this little farm in Texas he was exhausted. He had gotten up at three in the morning, mm -hmm. and he read a scene from the the script, and he was not that great. Not that he wasn't great, but it just didn't wow us. And so Stephen said, "Let's do an improv." And so he set up this improv, 
and said, you, you have, like I said, you have this alien and this man is coming from NASA and he's heard that you has, have the alien and do everything you can to keep him go. And that's what happened. Huh. And so we're all standing behind the camera, uh, Stephen and Frank Marshall and Kathy Kennedy, and weeping. Just bawling. Because, literally bawling. I can bawling. only imagine. Like it's, yeah. it's making me emotional exactly. thinking about it. And then finally Stephen says to Mike, tell him he can keep him. Tell him he can keep him. Because we're all, we're all like. <laughs> let, let him yeah. off the hook. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Look so, at you, you're crying. I know, I got, I got emotional <laughs> thinking about it because I, I started visualizing this. Because he, if you haven't seen it, go watch it now. Pause, come back. Yes, it's, well, we'll you'll set up a link because it's, it's amazing. It's so amazing to watch him mm -hmm. just because he's so there. Mm -hmm. And it, it's fascinating to me that you say that he read and was just... Eh. I think he was exhausted. What, and what it just, gives you guys... The, like, when do you see somebody who's just mad and... This is the... I'm sorry to No, please, uh, I think you know where I'm going. This is the thing that as casting directors and directors have an instinct mm -hmm. and it's finely honed and I can't explain what it is, sure. but I've been doing it long enough. I mean, I was very young when that happened, but you just get an essence of people and you're rooting for them and you want them to be good. And mm -hmm. so you try and create a situation where they're gonna be good. And uh, there was something about him that was undeniable and we wanted to make it work. And and that's just an, an it factor that you can't really describe. It's hard, uh, it is yeah. very hard to put a, f a finger on it. But I think as actors, if you come into the room and you make some strong choices, and people talk about this all the time, choices, what, what are choices? It means that you are actually showing us who this character is by how you're thinking about it and how you're interpreting it. Even if you make the wrong choice, let's say you're completely wrong about what we're looking for, but if you've made some smart choices, I will wanna work with you and help guide you toward what is okay. the right choice, because I can tell you're a smart actor, and, I, and if you look right for the role, I want to guide you towards what we're looking for because you came in and you didn't just recite it off the page. You made some strong choices and that's what we're looking for. So as a casting director and looking at that from the casting side for up and coming casting directors, is there any advice that you could give about going with your gut and ha having those feelings and, and using sure, them? Sure, for the filmmaker, it's important to Trust yourself and trust those that you've hired in all the departments. Uh, when you hire a department head, you have interviewed a lot of people, you've hopefully called other films for their references. Mm -hmm. That's a key thing to do, don't just... What do you mean by that? Uh, don't just meet someone and decide to hire them. Look at their f other projects and call the people that worked on those films oh. and check them out because... Okay. You, what it's like to work with somebody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, How important I, that factors into? Yeah, I mean, I do that when I'm hiring an assistant or an associate in my office because sure. their resume might look great on, in black and white, and then I call the person that they work for, and they said they were a nightmare, and a lot of the stuff they have on there is not even true. Hmm. So you always want to do that. But so you've taken the time to hire the right person for your department head as the director. You can't micromanage everything. You'll kill yourself. You have to be able to trust the people that you've hired and stand back and let them do their jobs. Trust them, trust yourself. There's, there's a, a fine line of collaboration and micromanagement, but I always suggest to filmmakers to make sure to trust the people that you've hired and, and let them do their jobs. Well, and is that something that you come up against often? You know, I, I have produced a few films and I see that with uh, some first time directors that aren't good at delegating and want to handle it all. And you can't handle it all. You simply can't. So advice for them would be hire the right people and let them right. do and their job. Exactly. And, and that has to do with uh, casting the right actors and let them do their job and don't micromanage. Mm -hmm. But be there to help them when they, when they need it. I also answers. suggest it's a great idea for directors to take acting classes. Because okay. I work with a lot of directors that are not articulate with actors. They, they, they don't know actors speak. They know where to put the camera. Mm. They're very technical. They're great with that. But they don't know how to get you where you need to go because they don't speak your language. So if you start taking acting classes, you'll start understanding what actors need from you as a director. Great advice. Um, I, I think, I, I, if I remember right, it was a Spielberg quote that I heard very, very early on in my career that a director should be second best at everything on set. 
So they should know, they should be second best at producing, they should be second mm-hmm. best at, at lighting, they should be second, so that they can communicate with every single department. And it seems like, it, because I've been on a lot of sets where the director doesn't know how to communicate with the actors, but they can tell you exactly how they're gonna make the CG dragon appear that's from over I'm, top of the exactly mountain. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. It's very important. And as a director, you're gonna be asked 450 questions a day by all your Absolutely. department heads. And you've got to know what film you're making and, and what you want and what you need. Mm-hmm. So speaking of that and speaking with communication with other people on set, who is it that a casting director is communicating with? And how, how does that communication from the inception of you getting onto the job, getting the script and being like, yes, I have to do this, through the process of casting and even beyond that, what is, what is the process of a casting director? <laughs> I know that's a very broad question. How much time How much do you have? Do we have? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> but back to the original part of the question yes. is who do we communicate with mm-hmm. is uh, we are married to the director mm-hmm. and the producer. It's a very intimate relationship, the director and the producers. And uh, we talk every day, multiple times a day uh, or through email. Mm-hmm. And then if it's a television project, you have the studio executives and then the network executives. So let's say you're casting a, a TV show. It's the studio is Warner Brothers for NBC. So you have two ah, okay. giant groups of people, executives, that I have to deal with every day. And in dealing with, what exactly does that mean? Are you it is means, it convincing people oh, a direction to go? Is it? It's, you know, when I come up with an idea, Mm -hmm. I have to get 30 people to sign off on it. So that's my job. Uh, We start with the director and the producer, and then it goes out from there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's from the biggest roles to the smallest roles. And so uh, it is talks about their availability, what they cost, uh, getting them the right footage that they need to see, in addition to the audition, but mm-hmm. some other footage to, to help them come to the decision. It's very psychological. You want them to feel like they've come to this decision on their own rather than you ramming it down their throat. So what we do as casting directors has a, a lot to do with finesse and politics and psychology. Okay. And it's spinning a lot of plates and being very, very extremely organized so that you can uh, inform your team of what you need them to know. But starting at the beginning is I get a script mm-hmm. and and uh, usually from a producer or director, or I have to go out and meet on it like you do as an actor. Because uh, you're basically and, auditioning for a job too exactly. when you're going out. Yeah. Uh, and then when we start it, we break down the script and usually have a concept meeting with the filmmakers and the network and our studio about what we're looking for. Some things are very clear in terms of we need a name mm-hmm. for these roles, and it just comes down to a giant list that we just start uh, breaking down by availability and who we're interested in and who's interested in us and sure. making offers. And then for the other roles, we have auditions. And that's my favorite part because I love working with actors. And, and you read uh, with your actors too, Yeah, right? I, that's my favorite thing to do because I can tell when I'm reading with someone whether they're listening. Sure, when I'm that's in easy the scene, to figure out. I can feel it better than when I'm watching someone else reading. Okay. And uh, I really enjoy that part of the process. And... Uh, so we start having auditions and narrowing things down and callbacks and tests. And the casting director negotiates the deals. I don't know if you guys know that. No, not at all. Uh, and depending on how large the deal is, sometimes the attorneys will do it if it's a giant deal. It's a, it's a, it's a big process from beginning to end. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's basically the reason we started the show is it's it's not a very transparent process especially from the outside as an actor looking in we don't know what we're going into and that i think is kind of unfortunate because the more you know about what it is that you're going in for the casting director that you're going in for mm-hmm. uh, what their preferences are on certain things the work that they've done before you can find a lot of that stuff out by going on imdb but knowing the process of who you're talking to and the things that 
you know, it's really easy, I feel, in the beginning of the process to get really discouraged because you're not booking the role, because you're not landing every time you go in, even though when you think you killed the audition. But there are a thousand different factors that go into who books a role and who doesn't book a role. Exactly. There are a thousand different factors. And if you look at this as a numbers game, mm -hmm. when I release a breakdown for a project, I will get several thousand submissions for each role. We look at all of them. My office looks at all of the submissions. We go through them very diligently. If you even get in the room, so let's say there's thousands of people submitted mm -hmm. and we bring in 30. If you're one of those 30, you've already won. Even if you don't sure. get the role, and this is how you have to start thinking about this and changing your mindset, that if you even come in, whether you book it or not, you're already building blocks to have a relationship with that casting office. Mm -hmm. uh, the producer and director maybe get to know you and think, oh, he's not right for this, but we'll think of him for something else. Mm -hmm. This happens all the time when I'm casting a pilot where someone will come in and read and they're ultimately not right for the role, but they'll say, when we go to series, this person will be great. And so I put them in that pile ah, okay. for a guest star or a sure. co star. So if you even get in the room you've already won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very daunting and, and you take things personally if you don't get it. Yeah. But uh, you have to reset your, your brain to not think that your goal is not to get the role. I know that sounds antithetical, mm -hmm. but your goal is to consistently come in to all of the rooms, all the auditions, and be consistently good and prepared so that we can depend on you and keep calling you back. It's not about getting the role, it's about just coming in and, and doing good work. And that will pay off in the long run. Book that room, not the role. Yeah. But back to casting and what we do, it's sure. a very creative process where we work with the filmmaker to help them fill in the world that they've created in the script. And it's really our job to take what's on the page and think outside the box. And I think that's what makes a good casting director is not just take what's on the page and bring in exactly that, but think uh, a little bit uh, more creatively, and that's what some of us do best. And uh, these days, we, and we, not even these days, we have been doing this for a long time. We have been thinking, um, casting uh, with diversity and inclusivity, taking a role that's written one way and going, you know, that's interesting, but what about this woman for this role that's written for a man mm -hmm. or what about I know this is written in a very specific way but let's see a lot of diverse actors for this and and sure. so now the filmmakers and the community are finally catching up to what we've been trying to do for years uh, but now it's much more encouraged and uh, accepted and it's a must a must do. So you're seeing more push now for absolutely. the types of casting that you like to do with, yeah, with, absolutely. with and you pride yourself also on kind of casting off type. Yeah? Yes, always. I I don't like the whole concept of type. Mm -hmm. Uh it gets boring and it paints you into a corner and I like unexpected ideas and that's what makes things interesting. I mean, a couple examples I can think of is is uh, Mr. Lithgow and Footloose mm -hmm. seem to be a little off type, especially because I read the original script and it seemed... It's funny that you know that because I talk about this a lot of time. It's my, it's my perfect example of mm. that is that it was written as a Paul Newman-esque, attractive, yeah. salt and pepper haired guy. And I thought, okay, interesting. I'll bring in guys like that. But I had just seen uh, Lithgow in uh, The World According to Garp, where he plays a transsexual. So good. And then a serial killer in Brian De Palma's mm -hmm. Blowout. And I thought, this guy is so interesting. Yeah. And I suggested him to the director, and he was, looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and so this is, again, sure. part of what we do is to be passionate about our ideas and get up on the table and push it through. And I said, just trust me on this one. This is, again, where the director needs to trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came in and read, and this is the days before video cameras even existed. So, it so was everybody just, had to be in the room. And nobody was in the room. It was no. I mean, <laughs> it, this it again. Still... Uh, it was the director Herbert, Herbert Ross and uh -huh. myself, and how it worked is we would then tell the studio who we wanted, and it really wasn't. <laughs> it's was a very different it. world. Yes. So he read one scene, and literally the hair stood up on on my my arms, and 
the director gave him the role in the room. Ah. And a same thing with Chris Penn in that movie. Uh, that sure. role was written for a, a really uh, attractive uh, jock football player. And I thought, okay, interesting. But I had just cast Chris Penn in a movie called um, All the Right Moves with uh, Tom Cruise. And I just thought... This kid is just so interesting and so uh, it had this kind of bull in a china shop guilelessness. Just did he loved know how him. to dance before? No, 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 no. You can no. tell he learned oh, on yeah. that movie, oh, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and so brought him in, and everybody fell in love with him, and literally rewrote the role for him so that it fit him better. Mm-hmm. Oh, so again, okay. as an actor, if you get called in for something and you think I'm not right for this, go in anyway and show them your stuff because. If you're good and interesting, they can change the role for you. Absolutely. Another off-type character that I feel like one of my favorites, and I just recently watched it for the first time because I knew I was interviewing you, was in Insomnia. Uh-huh. I'd never seen the movie. I'd never heard of that movie. Oh, wow. And Chris I Nolan. Said on it, Chris Nolan. Mm-hmm. Robin Williams. Wow. Robin Williams, yeah. off-type yeah. as hell in that movie. Yeah. But Wow. He so was really, really good. So Al Pacino was already cast, okay. and I had to cast the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. And Robin's agent, Mike Menchel at CAA, suggested him for the role, and I thought, this is brilliant. This is exactly what we need. Yeah. And he will kill it. Because I'd already seen him do some darker stuff. He had started, like, right around that time was when he was starting yeah. to do And so more. I knew, and again, I like that unexpected casting, and I knew he would bring a lot of depth to it mm-hmm. and darkness. You f- I find that a lot of uh, comedians have a very dark side. Yeah. And uh, it runs deep. Mm-hmm. And he was so good in that movie. He was really, really good in that yeah. one. Um, that's fantastic. I, I love, one, I love comedians and, and people who play in that comedy world when they take a step outside of that. Because I think you're right. There is a, there is a like darkness. Adam Sandler is really yes. great in dramatic movies. Absolutely. Like him much better in his drama than his For comedy. Sure. Jim Carrey? Yeah. Another mm-hmm. great dramatic actor who doesn't give an, I don't think he gets enough credit for mm-hmm. the dramatic work that he's done. Exactly. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so there are a couple other movies that we'll hit on as we go through this, but are there any instances of somebody coming into a casting room that just do the wrong thing? <laughs> Again, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a story. I have a few. I have a hundred stories. I can imagine. Uh, here's one. I was casting a TV pilot and the son's role was written for a kid who uses a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And it was based on the producer's real life and his son actually uses a wheelchair. So it was, it was really um, important Mm -hmm. that we have an authentic kid. So we put the word out and we very quickly went through all the actors in Los Angeles who used a wheelchair. And I reached out on social media and uh, contacted the Christopher Reeve Foundation. I got a lot of help from them and started getting a lot of self tapes made from actors across Hmm. the country and did a very big search across the country and continued to see actors in Los Angeles. So uh, in this casting session, uh, this kid comes in and, and every time someone comes in and they look right for the role, you know, we're just rooting for them. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, please be good, please be good, please be good. And he does the scene and my assistant, he was really good. And my assistant and I looked at each other and we were like, oh my God, this is so great. We found him, we found him. And um, so uh, we talked to him about his, I forgot how this exactly came up, but we were talking about some of the things that he can do uh, physically, because some kids use a wheelchair, but they actually uh, can walk on um, crutches as well, and they use the wheelchair to, to get around, so we just wanted to know what her, his situation was. And he goes, oh, I don't, I don't need a wheelchair, and he stands up, and he says, I just used this for the audition. And <laughs> look at your face. That's horrible. I know, because he's sitting in the in the waiting room with kids that yeah. are really um, disabled. And I don't blame the kid. This is totally his parents. You know, he was sure. 10 years old. So he doesn't know any better. Sure. So 
I mean, there's smoke coming out of my ears at this point. And so I said, okay, thank you. Can you bring your parents in here? So I had a little chat with his parents to tell them how set them straight. this was not appropriate no. in any way, shape, or form. You know, it's not the kid's fault. His parents put him up to it. But there was something, uh, uh, I, I subconsciously, when he came in and, I, and he had one of those giant wheelchairs that you rent. Oh, sure. And it wasn't like the my, normal. Yeah, so something in my head went, this is odd. Uh huh. That's... So that's one wrong thing to do. Uh, another thing, I noted. Think another great story is <laughs> noted, right? Uh, I was casting a TV show and the role called for, you know, those high end men's shave shops where uh, oh, sure. you go and get an amazing shave and there's beautiful women taking care of you. Yeah. So the role was for one of the, the women that, that do the services. And so we had uh, all the producers in the room and we had the actor that was going to be playing the part of the guy getting the shave and brought in some uh, women to read this role. So this one actress comes in and she says, oh my God, I never get these parts. I'm such a tomboy. Everybody thinks I have a dick. And everybody laughs and like, ha. So she does the scene and she's actually very good. Uh And she leaves and everybody turns to me and says, does she have a dick? What? (laughs) So she had, through her nervousness and self-deprecating humor, had planted this seed of doubt that grew into this tree, and no one could even concentrate on what she was doing because they're all going, does she have a dick? Is is she, like... How often do actors get in their own way like that? All the time. All the time. I mean, this maybe like not necessarily self, with the I have a dick comment. Direct, but. but, you know, this self-sabotaging fear of, like, I'm not good at this, and oh, I just got this last night, or, you know, just all the excuses. Sure. And so, yeah, it was so no one could even see the good work that she did because they were so caught up in what she had said. It, yeah. it, but that happens all even just walking into the room and... From the, I've seen people blow it before their butt hits the chair because they put off a bizarre energy. Sure. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the moment before coming into an audition room. What, what, well, first let's start with from, from a casting director's perspective. What are you doing in that room before we walk in? Because for us, it's this black I'm box that we walk in and then we step out of, and it just I'm answering a million disappears. emails. I'm on the phone. I'm, you know, spinning plates, trying to get stuff done in between auditions. And we walk in saying, hey, look look what I can do. And yeah, then... and so, and, you know, we're all, you walk into the room and we've just lost our financing or the director's kid is sick or we just got a shitty call from the executive. And so there's always something going on. You walk into this room and it might feel really cold and toxic, you yourself, you have to protect yourself against that so that you don't take on our, sometimes our weird energy uh, and start getting freaked out by that. So there's all sorts of things that you can do to protect yourself in these situations because this is your room. This is your five, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's about taking power in that room. And uh, it goes back to the night before of just being as prepared as you possibly can, knowing the material inside and out, you are completely off book. Mm -hmm. Don't come in and be reading it off the page. We don't need to see that because the next guy's gonna come in and be off book and engaging and connecting to the reader and it's gonna blow you out of the water. So there's all this prep that you can do ahead of time. And then the waiting room can completely screw you up. Yeah, I can. Uh, There's so many, uh, things going on where sometimes it's as cold as ice and you can like cut the tension mm-hmm. or there's some guy blabbing about how he's gotten all these auditions and you're feeling like crap because you haven't gotten any in the last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so protect yourself. Put your earbuds in. Don't listen to this. Get into your zone. For me, when I go on a meeting with a producer or director, I get there on time and I'm ready to go and they keep me waiting and I deflate. And so I, as an actor, I know that you get there on time and you men- sometimes have to wait an hour. Sure. And don't you kind of lose it? And by the time you get yeah. in there, you're kind of pissed off. Absolutely. And a little It's easy to hold on to those. And, yeah. yeah. So do what you need to do for yourself. Like for me, I know I can't sit down. I need to keep standing. Okay. If I sit down, I just kind of 
<laughs> if you have a really emotional scene to do and you're in the waiting room and you're, you're getting into that zone, uh, like let's say your father just died and you're coming in to do that scene where your father just died and then you come in and they're like, hey, how are you, Charlie? What's going on? And they start getting chit-chatty with you, mm -hmm. uh, which is rare these days because most people just want to get to the scene. But let's yeah. say they do something like that. You, it's totally fine for you to say, can we just jump into the scene and, and we'll, we can talk after? That's part of taking control of your audition. Okay. It's totally fine to do that. Now, me as a casting director who's been doing this for a thousand years, I can see when you come in that you're ready to go, You know that you need to do the scene. And sure. if the director starts chatting with you, I will usually jump in and say, let's, let's jump to the scene and, and we'll talk after. But it's your, it's your duty to protect yourself and to and protect your audition and say, let's jump in. Mm -hmm. to the scene or um, let's say you are again doing this very emotional scene uh, let's say you have two scenes to do you have this happy scene first and then you have this very dramatic scene to do um, back to back mm -hmm. so it's fine for you to say give me a moment because it, you know you're not a machine you can't just like sure switch now I'm angry yeah, switch right? now I'm sad uh, and yeah. we as Casting directors should know this process. Some of us don't, unfortunately. So you can say, um, give me a moment. I'll look up when I'm ready. And so take that moment to gather yourself, uh, figure out what your, your intention is. Just give yourself whatever that trigger is to get you into the scene. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you're kind of telling the camera person what you're going to do. Or, okay. or uh, let's say you want to walk into frame. Tell the camera person, I'm going to walk into frame. Tell them what you're going to do. Don't ask for permission to do it. Again, that's taking control. Because it's, <clears throat> basically you're saying, take ownership of that room. As yeah. soon as you walk in, that is your room. Own yeah. it. Yeah, uh, but you know, there's a, you can get away with murder if you are gracious and you are smart and you are um, polite. Okay. And so if you're suddenly, you know, being obnoxious and ordering people around, that's not going to work. Don't be but an if asshole, you, but... Right. But if you do it in the right way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and let's say you go up on your lines in the very beginning. Don't say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Can I please start over? I'm so... Can I... Can I please... Just say, I'm going to start over. And start mm. over. That's taking control. And sure. also it makes us feel like we're in good hands. Because... Okay. We can see that you're not... Uh, falling into a puddle when you, you screw up a line. You're like, all right, I missed a line. I'm starting over. So what? <laughs> so that's in the room. And we talked a little bit about before. What about after? Finish the scene. We've had our little conversation. Get out. <laughs> yeah, just leave. <laughs> Be gone. Yeah. Uh, and then, but the after of what you do for your mental health mm -hmm. is very important. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Uh People have all different ways of, of uh, handling that. Mm -hmm. Some people say, um, make sure you plan an activity right after that so that you're going huh. into doing something else, takes your mind off of it. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's so many things you can do. Uh, some people actually like rip up the sides. That's, I started doing that uh -huh. a couple years back, and it's very helpful. But what if you get a call back and you have all these great notes and on I, there? I, I mean, I don't throw them away, but oh, I rip them up. There's the act so of... So you have this pile of ripped yeah, sides. Yeah. So there's this... The, the act of ripping it up, it's, for me, is just let go. Yeah. I mean, and that's there's, important. Uh, I have a friend that says take off something. So ah, okay. if you wore a jacket for it or you wore a bracelet or you wore something, take off something. So it's kind of like sheds sure. the skin. Disconnect uh -huh. from that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And just learn from what you did. Uh, if you're coming out of there and you're and you're saying, oh, you know, I didn't do what I wanted to do. I really fucked this up. Then you got to learn from that. What went wrong? What sent you off the rails? Mm -hmm. What was it? Be honest with yourself. And uh, a lot of times it just comes down to lack of preparation. When you get nervous, it's because you're probably not prepared. I think it's really hard as an actor to let go when you when you really put the work in. But because you coach actors as well, what sort of advice do you have for actors who have that difficulty letting go of the, the work that they're putting in, even if they're not booking? I, I went to an acting class a few months ago and one of the actors said, I have been called into this particular casting office 
15 times in the last year, and they never hire me. And I said, what is your problem? What is, this, this office wants to hire you. Hmm. They just haven't found the right role that hasn't connected yet. They keep calling you in because they're trying to get you a job. They really like you. Interesting. Just because you haven't booked it, it just it doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with the roles not connecting with you, and sooner or later it will. Mm -hmm. They keep calling you in because they love you. You can't. There's so much in this business that you can't control. You don't look right for the role. You look too much like the writer's ex-wife. You you mm -hmm. you don't fit in with the ensemble that we have already. But the one thing you can control is your mindset about it how you think about it. And so that just goes back to mental health and that's something that, that you need to look at carefully. And instead of thinking of yourself as an actor coming into the room, I need a job, please hire me. Think of yourself as one of the collaborators. It'll change how you walk into the room. Hmm. Think of yourself as uh, someone that we need. You know, you have this series um, and you titled it Gatekeepers. And I think language is very powerful and if you start thinking of us as the gatekeepers that are keeping you from a job then that's already putting you in the de on the defense if you uh start if you're calling yourself a starving artist or a struggling actor you're gonna be that mm -hmm. these words are very powerful and if you think of yourself as a collaborator coming and also the, the phrase, like, the people on the other side of the desk. Remember, you're part of this puzzle, and, if, and you're a filmmaker, too. Mm -hmm. And we need you. And if you think of yourself as coming into this room and pulling up a chair at a round table and collaborating with us, you'll come in much more powerful. And these are the things that you can control. And it's the, in that reframing. <clears throat> Your mindset. And you get, yeah. that's the good news, is you have control of that. I wonder why it is that many people don't. Do that? Why? Why because the mentality? Because you're, you're vulnerable. Listen, you're you're an artist, and in, mm. in part of what makes you good is your vulnerability. So there, we're, there's, there's those two things within us that are pitting yeah, against exactly. one another. That totally makes sense. Um, so, what have been some of the hardest roles for you to cast? Sometimes the, the hardest roles to cast are, are roles that are written with a very specific description. Mm -hmm. Like I cast this movie called Vampire Academy and it was based yeah. on a series of uh, young adult novels and I really had to pay attention to the, the text, to, I mean, to the, uh, the descriptors and, and how the roles were written. I couldn't go off and, and be creative in terms of the type. I had to cast exactly the way it was written because it was a very specific world that this writer had created okay. in terms of all the characters mm -hmm. in that world. And so one role was written for a six foot seven, handsome Russian vampire. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> not sure, easy to find. Where are you gonna find, find a six foot seven right? Russian? <laughs> yeah. So I uh, did a worldwide search and found mm -hmm. this amazing actor in uh, Russia. He had never done an American movie. He was a big star in Russia, but this is his first American movie. His name is Daniela Kozlovsky. Yeah, yeah. He's not, Six foot seven, but he was six foot two mm -hmm. and big guy. Amazing looking and 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 strong and uh, so it's hard when something is written very specifically mm -hmm. uh, that you have to find exactly that type. Uh, I was casting a movie for George Romero called Land of the Dead, and there was one role that was also like a six foot seven Tahitian god, and and I just couldn't find oh who was a woman oh. That and makes I was like, I mean, and like as, as when I'm reading the script, I'm reading it going, oh, fuck me. This is, <laughs> what am I going to, this is never, I can swear, right? I've yeah, already absolutely. swore in and out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, God damn you. Uh -huh. How am I ever going to, and uh, we looked everywhere and we couldn't, we literally couldn't find there her. There just was no and six foot seven no, Tahitian. And so we, we had to just change what we're looking for and find sure. someone that made sense because I couldn't find that. So it's usually was, those, that a, was that written specifically by Romero? The six foot seven, yeah. yeah. Damn him. How was it working with him? Oh, you know, I, I horror especially movies, in the genre that he created. I know. So horror movies are not my thing, mm -hmm. but I thought if I'm going to do one, I'm going to do one with the yeah, guy. Yeah, absolutely. So he was just a ball of fun. He was and a really fun movie. Yeah, to work on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, he was just 
everything that you would want him to be. He was really a good guy and uh, very sweet and very creative and funny, and it was it was a good time. Were, were there any added difficulties in working with somebody like that? In, no, in people, their own genre? People were falling over themselves to, oh, to I can imagine. come in to do this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got a great cast. Yeah, you did. Uh, no, there were people just wanted to be in it. So along with the difficulties question, when you're doing a, a film that has kind of an ensemble cast, like uh, Vampire Academy, you've done so many, like St. Elmo's Fire. Mm -hmm. That movie I also watched for the first time in preparation to interview you. What? What, you've yeah. never seen it before? I had never How'd seen How'd that happen? I had, I have seen Breakfast Club a million times. Uh -huh. I did, the first play I did in Los Angeles was The Breakfast Club oh on stage. Wow. I had never what seen St. Almost Fire. Uh, what do you think? Oh, God. Okay, um, I'm going to say, so when was this? This How was this was eight years ago. I'm going to say the Anthony Michael Hall role. No. Okay, wait. Second choice. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me you played Bender. I didn't. Okay. Uh, then Emilio. Yeah. Wow, cool. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. It was <laughs> it was literally a word. They took I didn't the know there was a play. No, it, it's not. It's okay. They literally took the script of the film, gave it to us. Oh, cool. And we did it in a black box theater for like four weeks. The material. It was amazing. Is so, what's amazing about it is you can still watch it to this day and the material it holds totally up. totally holds now, up. Now, St. Elmo's Fire looks dated to me. It does. It feels I mean, dated. It, it was it so hip. It is an 80s film. It was so hip and cutting edge at the time, but yeah. the material is not as timeless as... The music. Uh, the day. Yeah. Um, Breakfast, Breakfast Club, the material, just, it's still... Oh, sure. Is, it, it resonates sure. now. But so you're saying casting ensembles... Yeah, so when you're casting an ensemble, like that one, there, there's a couple aspects to this question. First is with that movie in particular, you cast some of the biggest like up and coming people as they were still up and coming. Breakfast yeah. Club came out the same year mm -hmm. as St. Elmo's Fire. And you've got cast members in that movie who are one in both films, you've got Emilio, but this up and coming world, how did you, how did you keep track in that because world? Because that's what we do. I mean, I had my ear to the ground and I knew all those kids. Mm -hmm. How um, do you, how do you, because when you have your ear in, to the ground? Because they were coming in and, and, you know, meeting me. Okay. Okay. You know, like a lot of them, I was their first audition. And oh, that's, wow. That's, that's going to be the title of my book, You Were My First. Sure. Um, I mean, a lot of those kids, you know, Johnny Depp, Chris Penn, mm -hmm. um, they were coming up, and I've been doing this a long time, so yeah. I was a lot of their first auditions. That's wild. So I knew all of them. So they were just kind of in my sure. you know, mental Rolodex. And, and I, I remember when I met Joel Schumacher, the director, uh, I, I suggested Mayor Winningham for that role mm -hmm. you know, in, in my audition. She was wonderful um, in that role. And, you know, so we come in and we have these ideas. And it just, like, it was written so well, the, 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 it was very clear to me who would be great. So and through a process of auditioning and auditioning and, and screen tests, and, and we found our cast. So, I mean, and that one's, what, it was 85? I think, yeah. 85? Then you've got Vampire Academy that came out what, two or three years ago, mm -hmm. four years ago maybe. Um, that one I think of kind of as an ensemble cast as well. I think that there's a lot of people that are in that one that you're seeing. Claire Foy. Yeah. You're <laughs> By the way. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're seeing so many people from Vampire Academy start sh starting to show up. Well, Zoe and Deutsch. She's killing it. Yeah. Cameron Monaghan mm -hmm. doing Gotham right now, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he was on Shameless, Shameless. for years. Yeah. Like you, you've, you've found a lot of these people, it almost seems like. What, what contributes to that? F helping... Propel. I'm good. <laughs> there you go. <coughs> no, I just, you know, I, I, I have an idea. You know, I knew Zoe mm -hmm. uh, when we had our very first, when I had my very first concept meeting with the producers. Uh, Mark Waters, the director, brought her up. Yeah. He said, you know, let's do Zoe Deutsch and put her through a Linda Hamilton Terminator. You know, uh, like redo her body. It worked. Yeah, and so through you know audition thousands of auditions mm -hmm. came down to screen tests and uh it just you know it, it just became it comes very becomes very clear mm -hmm. when 
they come in for the audition and the screen test. That movie was very difficult because I was on a very difficult deadline because uh, they wanted to bring a package of the leads to the um, Berlin Film Festival to, to do pre-sales. Oh, okay. And so I had to cast the two girls and Danila in four weeks, which is kind of unheard of well, for quick the leads of a movie. Yeah. Uh, but it helped them get their pre-sale, and then we were able to cast the rest of the movie. Okay. But uh, casting an ensemble is one of my favorite things. I really like uh, putting together what I call this dinner party of the people at the table and having to make sure that the right people are at the table and the right people are sitting next to each other at the table. Okay, sure. Uh, I just Because if you put two people who are sitting beside one another that, that don't, don't get work, along. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just have this sense, and again, it's that... that that instinct that's really hard to explain. Uh, but I just have this innate sense of who works well together and who will bring out the best in each other. With both of those movies, but more so, St. Elmo's Fire, they were all best friends. It, I mean, you could watch that movie and swear that they had known each other since they were children. Well, they became best friends. And, yeah. Um, but like I said, I knew all of them mm -hmm. uh, personally and socially. And so uh, it just made sense that they all came together. Okay. Um, well, let's. I want to talk a little bit about Mr. Waters because you've worked with him mm -hmm. on a ton of films. I'm curious about uh, a <coughs> the relationship between a casting director and a director, and how one you guys have maintained a relationship for so long and worked on so many great films together, especially in the YA uh, mm -hmm. world. Uh, and I'm not really sure, what was the first one that you two worked on together? Freaky Friday. Freaky Friday was the first one, mm -hmm. which is a home run mm -hmm. out of the, uh, just. And then Mean Girls after that. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a very collaborative relationship. I don't take it for granted. I never assume that he's gonna hire me for his next project. Mm -hmm. um, but he better. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I love working with him because he is an actor's director. He understands how to talk to actors. He loves the casting process. Mm -hmm. He gives great notes. He expects a lot from actors. He's just great in the audition process. He's also uh, so smart and articulate uh, in terms of dealing with all of his department heads and the studio and, and like he's just so politically smart mm -hmm. and a good guy is a mensch you know he's just a lovely man he calls sure. his wife of 25 years his bride mm. you know he's just a lovely man and uh he he knows what he wants he knows how to get it uh, we have a great relationship and a great shorthand because we've done so many movies together and so we will uh remember somebody from a prior oh, uh, yeah group of auditions from another film that we did you know what about that girl that we met on the last project sure. and, and we just have a great shorthand and we have a ball we we really uh, love working together he trusts me mm -hmm. and uh and then there's the brother so mark waters brother is daniel waters danny waters wrote heathers oh and he also hmm. wrote vampire academy Okay. And he also wrote this pilot that we just did called Fashion Victim. And so, uh, you know, there's just this wildly creative uh, family. And uh, we just, we love working together. How did the relationship start? From Freaky I mean, Friday. How, he hired but me how, how did you get... I went in and auditioned. You know, I went in and went on, on an audition. With sure. Him. And they hired me. So what is that audition process like as a casting director? Uh, it's not fun, quite honestly. Uh, <laughs> I go in there and I bring in, I, I'll take the, the lead few characters and I'll make some lists on who I think is right because mm -hmm. there's a lot of great casting directors out there and uh, they're basically hiring uh, you for your taste, your connections, your the work that you've done, and also... At the end of the day, it's kind of like, who do, I, who do I want to spend the next three months with? Who do I want to go into war with? Mm -hmm. Because you become business partners, and I represent them out into the world of Hollywood. And so uh, it's, for them, I guess it's just a gut feeling, 
But I have to go in, the, in there and kind of give away my ideas, which is not comfortable, but it helps, it helps them see how I'm thinking. Okay. And what my gut is and what, you know, where I would take this and what my plan is. So from that first one working with, with Mr. Waters to the last one that you've done with him, what sort of things have you grown to understand about one another and one another's process that would have made the first one that much easier? Well, we have this really fun banter of um, I'm very passionate about my ideas and I will bring up something and he'll say no fucking way. And mm-hmm. so then we have this you know, good-natured debate where I try to bring him around and sometimes it just I get stonewalled and sometimes he'll come back around and go okay yeah you were right let's let's go for this sure uh and so we just I don't know we've always just trusted each other I know when to uh push it and I know when to pull back and uh he's just great to work with yeah I wish there were more like him any parting messages that you'd like to give to actors? Uh, and, and let's definitely uh, talk about all the things that you're doing as well. So you're, you've got a bunch of articles on Backstage, uh, yeah, Advice I have a Columns, column on backstage. which is extremely beneficial. Uh, you should all check that out. What other things are you doing? Uh, well, in addition to casting, I coach actors. So I, I do private coaching to help them prepare for their upcoming auditions or once they have the job to help them prep for the job. Mm-hmm. And so it's uh, either in person or on Skype or FaceTime because I have a lot of clients that I work with that are not in Los Angeles and uh, they need some coaching. I think it's it's just a smart thing to have another set of eyes on your audition. You shouldn't be preparing by yourself. Uh, And as a casting director, I have a very unique training in terms of what needs to happen in the room and what you need to do to deliver. Mm -hmm. I also can uh, film your self-tape because people are self-taping more often than not. It's something I love doing. And how do people reach out to you about these Uh, services? So on my website. Okay, which is? Uh, MarcyLeroff.com. Perfect. Easy to remember. Uh-huh. We'll have that in the links in the description as well. Uh, I also created an online class called How to Audition for Film and Television. Okay. And you will provide that link. Absolutely. And it's uh, a once you uh, buy your subscription, you have a lifetime membership, and I put up new articles and uh, video all the time. It's how to navigate the audition process. Okay. And people have found it very helpful. People have found it very helpful in actually all walks of life because it helps prep you for other jobs, you know, because a lot of what sure. I talk about is preparation and mindset and and how to be uh, controlling the room and things like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else that you're doing? No, I that think you're okay. Good. Yeah, That's great. This is great. I really enjoyed having the conversation Me with you. Me too. I, I've, I've, honestly, I've got... Probably more three questions. more pages worth of questions, but we just you don't have the time. You ask great questions. You ask I'm glad questions to hear that. that were not the usual questions, and I love that. Good. I, I, the really, usual you've, questions. You've, prepped really you've got well. a lot of things online, and again, we're going to link to all of them because it's been my research in asking these questions. So, again, thank you very much for having thank us. Thank you, Charlie. And this everyone, is great. Marcy Learoff. Thank you. <laughs> Well, there it is. Episode number one of Placing Faces. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, love, smiley face, heart, thumbs up, pass along, share, all those things with as many people as possible so we can continue making this show. It really is a labor of love. So the more people that we can get to listen, the more we can continue doing this. Tune in next week when we interview Richard Hicks, who's worked on titles like Gravity, Zero Dark Thirty, and my favorite movie of 2016, Hell or High Water. It's a great conversation, and Richard, having been the head of the Casting Society of America, is extremely knowledgeable about all things casting. Placing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale your production based on your needs. Video professionals find work, and companies save money. 
We'd also like to thank our partners at the Casting Society of America for helping to introduce us to so many of our guests. They also serve as a hub of information about this branch of the filmmaking industry. To learn more about the society and what it takes to get into casting, you can visit www.castingsociety.com. If you're a casting director and want to be a part of our program, please email us at contact at placingfaces.com. We really appreciate you listening, and we hope to continue to be able to share the lives and careers of these casting directors with you every single week. So tune in.